chapter four of um, the terrible thing that happened to Barnaby Brockett this morning. Well, this afternoon, whenever you're watching this. So um, chapter four is the best day of Barnaby's life so far. St Aloysius is the obvious choice, said Eleanor. The, the evening, she and Alistair were deciding what to do about Barnaby's education. It's only down the road, after all. I'm not sending him there, said Alistair. Most of our neighbours send their sons to that school. Everyone in Kirribilli will be talking about us. And what if it gets back to bother and blast it? People might look at me funnily. Well, where do you suggest then? asked Eleanor. What's the name of that school on Lavender Bay? It's only a little further away, but absolutely not, said Eleanor, looking at her husband as if he had no more sense than a rabbit. Jane, M Jane Macquarie Hamid across the street sends her little Duncan there. What would she say? Well, I don't know what other choices we have, replied Alistair with a sigh. We could always keep him at home, I suppose. Does he really need an education after all? Oh, of course he does, said Eleanor, scrolling through a list of Sydney schools on the internet until she found one that satisfied her needs. We can't add ignorance and stupidity to his other failings. Now look, here we are, she added triumphantly, spinning the laptop round to show her husband. The Graveling Academy for Unwanted Children. It's almost as if it was built with Barnaby in mind, said Alistair, examining the school's website, which made a great deal of the fact that it had been set up by a former governor of Dilwania women's prison to educate those children who, for one reason or another, had been rejected by the regular school system. Shall I make an appointment? It couldn't do any harm to visit. Anyway, it looks rather nice, doesn't it? he added, clicking through the photos on the computer screen. All that barbed wire on top of the walls is probably there as part of a project to teach the children about prisoner of war camps. And look, and the look of the building itself, said Eleanor. It's like one of those workhouses out of Oliver Twist. The children must love it. They certainly must, agreed Alistair. And so three days later, they found themselves sitting in front of Harriet Hooperman Hall, the school principal. It's not that he's not an intelligent little boy, said Alistair. He's actually very bright, said Eleanor. He reads the most extraordinary books. He prefers authors who are dead, she added, laughing a little, as if she had never heard of such an extraordinary thing. And he's never been in any trouble, said Alistair. But we do feel that Barnaby would benefit from some, how shall I put this, special attention? Mrs Hooperman Hall smiled and stroked her whiskers. She looked a little like a female goat, although her two front teeth resembled those of a droomdery. Before speaking, she ran her tongue along the thick, gloopy layer of dark red lips lipstick that stuck to the edges of her mouth like mortar to brick and snaked it in and out in a rather disgusting fashion. Alistair and Eleanor, she said, or may I call you Mr and Mrs Brockett? We at Graveling Academy have long suffered from a misunderstanding that our students are more difficult than those in other schools. Yes, it's true that some of our pupils have been in and out of young offenders institutions since before they could walk. And yes, it's an unfortunate fact that we have security cameras in every classroom and metal detectors over every door. And no, we don't go in for any of that modern mumbo jumbo that requires all our teachers to be board certified, whatever that means. I've never actually understood the term, have you? Well, I, th I think it means, but despite all these things, we pride ourselves on the fact that we open our doors at eight o'clock every morning and padlock them shut again every afternoon at three. And while nothing of very much use happens in the eight hours in between, I think that's seven hours, actually, said Alistair, who had always been good with numbers. While nothing of very much use happens in those eight hours in between, insisted Mrs Hooperman Hall, we do at least keep the children out of your way, which, let's face it, is what you're looking for. We embrace difference here, she added in a magnanimous tone. So your little Barnaby floats. What matter? We have a child of six who hops like a kangaroo, another who held up an off licence in an armed robbery and refuses to say where she stashed the loot, a third who speaks French fluently. But do we hold any of these things against them? No, we do not. 
which was good enough for Alistair and Eleanor. And shortly after this, they left the school, trying not to notice how the wallpaper was peeling off the walls. The carpets were covered in cigarette burns and the overflowing waste paper baskets next to them were quite clearly a fire hazard. Having had little contact with other children during his short life, except for Henry and Melanie, of course, Barnaby was understandably nervous during his first week at Graveling Academy for unwanted children. Fortunately for him, however, he was placed next to another new boy, Liam McGonagall, whose great, 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 great grandfather had been one of the first convicts to be shipped to Australia from Britain during the 1800s, having already been exported from Ireland for taking a pee on a statue of King George VI. Like Barnaby, Liam found the idea of spending the day with a classroom full of children he'd never met before intimidating. He too had failed to make friends, having been born with an unfortunate medical abnormality. His arms came to an end at the wrists and he had two neat sets of steel hooks where his hands should have been. These terrified most of the other children in the class, but didn't bother Barnaby in the slightest. In fact, he would have made a point of shaking Liam's right hook on the first morning they met and every morning afterwards, only this was impossible. For Mrs Hooperman Hall always collected him at the front door and brought him directly to his seat, tying him to his chair with a strong rope and a series of complicated knots. There's a picture of his friend Liam there. You can just see his hooks there. Was it an accident? He asked Liam when they became friendly enough to ask personal questions, which was only a few hours later. The loss of your hands, I mean. No, I was born like this, said Liam. It was just one of those things. Some people have no brain like Dennis Lichten over there. He nodded towards a taller than average boy who was engaged in a conversation with his shoes. Some have no sense of style, he continued, glancing at a nervous looking chap, George Rafferty, she who wore a Robin Hood type hat on his head. But me, I have no hands. I tried false ones for a while, but I couldn't get used to them. The hooks work better. I can do anything with my hooks except pick my nose. They're very shiny, said Barnaby, admiring the way they sparkled. That's because I polish them every morning before leaving the house, said Liam, pleased that Barnaby had noticed. I like to look good. Anyway, I've never known anything different, so they don't bother me at all, except I can't play basketball and I bet I'd be good at it. I'd be brilliant at it, said Barnaby. All I'd have to do with the ball is float up and drop it in the basket. I'd score every time. Have you always floated since the day I was born? Well, good on you, said Liam. And that was all it took to become friends. Simple, really. As the, past, as the weeks passed, the daily routine remained the same. Barnaby arrived at the Graveling Academy just before the starting pistol was sounded. It was immediately tied into his chair and left there for the rest of the day, while he did his best not to get too upset when the other boys picked on him, all the time forging a happy friendship with Liam. Do you like it at your new school? Alistair asked him one evening over dinner, looking up at his son as they finished off a rhubarb flan that Eleanor had been working on all afternoon and was almost, but not quite, palatable. No, it's horrible, said Barnaby. The place smells like rotten fruit and the other children are mean to me and we're never taught anything real. Today we spent an hour studying the kings, kings and queens of New Zealand, learned how to plant potato trees and were told that the capital city of Italy is Jupiter. It's Barcelona, isn't it? asked Alistair, who might have been very good with numbers, but had a bit of a blind spot when it came to geography. He'd never left Australia, of course, believing that normal people shouldn't want to see the world. In fact, he'd never even left the state of New South Wales. For that matter, he'd never even left Sydney. Mrs Hooperman Hall then said that she wanted to start a book club and asked if we had any suggestions for what we might read. I said the man in the iron mask and she told me that no, books like that were far too complicated for her and she wouldn't be able to sleep if her head was full of conspiracy theories. So then I suggested Bobby Brewster's bus conductor and she said she really only wanted to read books about vampires because they were all so stimulating and original. What does stimulating mean? asked Melanie, looking up. Henry snorted into his flan and Captain W.E. Johns allowed his ears to fall over his face. Melanie, 
snapped Eleanor, appalled. Do not use the word, that word. I will not have anybody being stimulated in this house. Do you hear me? It's not normal. I've never been stimulated in my life, added Alistair, and I'm in my 40s. I hate that school, muttered Barnaby. There's only one boy there who I get along with. He has a set of hooks where his hands should be. Excellent, remarked Henry. It's not excellent, insisted Eleanor, shaking her head as if she expected nothing less from a school that would accept her son as a student. It's abnormal, that's what it is, but still, I'm glad you're happy there. But I'm not happy there, said Barnaby. I just told you that. That's nice, dear. But as things turned out, his career at the Gravelling Academy would come to an abrupt end anyway. The following Wednesday afternoon, the rotten smell the greasy ceilings, the overflowing waste paper baskets, the cigarette burns, Mrs Hooperman Hall's lipstick and the peeling wallpaper all combined to start a spontaneous flame in the corner of a long corridor that separated the nearest students, still on probation from the lifers. The fire trickled along the ancient carpets, giving birth to a number of smaller flames as it licked its way under each door. And once inside Barnaby's classroom, it quickly climbed the walls, finding fuel to help it grow bigger and stronger at every turn. Within a few minutes, Mrs Hooperman Hall and the children were screaming and pulling the ancient steel bars off the windows, jumped out onto the roof and shining down the, the drain pipe to safety. Barnaby was still tied to his chair, however. No one had even thought of saving him. Help! he cried, pulling at his cords. But the more he did so, the tighter they became. Help me, someone! Oh dear, and there's a picture of uh, the fire in the classroom. And it's called A Bad Day at School. The flames were growing larger now and one entire wall of the classroom was eaten up by fire. Barnaby started to cough, feeling the smoke getting caught up in his throat and choking him as his eyes began to stream with tears. Help! he cried again, his voice barely audible now. He realised that this might be the last word he ever spoke and he would die here in the fire and never see Alastair Eleanor, Henry Melanie or Captain W.E. Johns again. He gave one more mighty pull on the ropes around his wrists and ankles, but nothing he did could make them loosen. Looking down, he realised that it would be impossible to set himself free and that he would have to face up to the next horrible few minutes with as much bravery as he could muster. Even if someone came back for him now, the knots had been pulled too tight for any human hands to unpick them. Which is why it was very lucky that the only person who came to help Barnaby didn't have human hands at all. He had a rather fine set of hooks instead. Sit still, Barnaby, cried Liam, coughing too and trying to keep his eyes focused on the ropes as he used the tips in a pincer movement to undo the knots. Stop pulling at them, you're making it harder for me. Barnaby did as he was told and soon began to feel a definite looseness around his left ankle. In a moment, he was able to pull his leg free, then another at his right. Then his left arm followed quickly by his right. Liam had done it. He had untied the knots. Oh, no, you don't, he said, locking his hooks around Barnaby's ankles as his friends started to float upwards to the ceiling, which was a flaming orange sea of fire by, by now. Jump on my back, Barnaby, and hold on tight. Barnaby did as he was told and the two boys made their way towards the window, jumped out and slid down the drain pipe, landing on the ground with an almighty bump that knocked them off their feet. Barnaby came very close to floating away again, only Liam was too quick for him and made sure to keep a tight hold. There she goes, said Barnaby, looking up at the ancient building as it gave in to the flames and collapsed in upon itself. They'll never be able to reopen it now, said Liam. The two boys looked at each other and broke into wide smiles. It was probably the best day of Barnaby Brockett's life so far. That's the end of that chapter. So their school has burnt down. Deary me, right. More of that to come. See you soon.